my path has been an unusual one. I've, I've been in clinical medicine, a little bit of computer science. Until recently, I, I had a wonderful six years at Google. And I've gotten really interested in what we sometimes call the long tail. So if, if you're building a search engine, it's actually really easy to do a terrific job for the popular queries, Lady Gaga, no problem. But in health and medicine, science is moving so fast that the important questions ahead of us have never been asked before. And there doesn't exist a document on the internet that can help us answer it. We, we talk a lot, we've talked a lot here about patient-centered medicine. And when we say that, what we usually mean is the contrast between a patient-centered approach versus an approach where the doctor and the health system is in the center and the patient is orbiting around. But I think implicit in most of our words when we say this is still the notion that expertise is flowing from the healthcare system to the patient. Let me share with you a story. About 10 years ago, in an online community for a rare cancer called leiomyosarcoma, there was an engineer and a social worker, patients in this community. And they said, you know what we need? We need a tissue bank controlled by patients where samples of our tumors are made available to the researchers who we think can help move science faster. So what they did is they went to PubMed, which is a publicly available resource, usually just used by scientists and clinicians, and they figured out which pathologist had published the most recent relevant articles about Leiomyer sarcoma, and they contacted him. And they convinced him to work with them on building this tissue bank. And in recent years, there's, there's now several hundred tissues of that rare cancer in this tissue bank, and the, the science for Leiomyer sarcoma has fundamentally shifted, has advanced more in those years because of those tissues that those patients put there. So in many cases, we have patients who aren't just experts in what they feel, in what they experience, but experts in the science of their disease. I'm going to ask you to, to join me in doing something a little bit uncomfortable. Let's, let's close our eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine that you or your spouse or your sibling was just diagnosed with cancer. You go to your first appointment with the oncologist and you get a sense, you know, I'm not sure that this doctor knows everything that's needed to be known to make sure that I get the best care. And imagine if this really happened to you or your loved one, three months from now, how much would you have made sure that you learned? So open your eyes if you haven't already. And one of your responses to that might be, well, I don't think I would have learned as much as one of the real clinical experts. But that's okay, because patients in this situation and their caregivers don't work alone. To explain what I mean, I want to give you an example from a non-health scenario. So this story is from an amazing book called Reinventing Discovery by Michael Nielsen. Please read it. In 1999, chess master Gary Kasparov had a match against the world, and everyone and anyone was allowed to be on the world team. And each move of the world team would be decided by a popular vote. Sounds like a terrible idea to me. And what happened was, so Ka Kasparov won, but barely. Remarkably, he said, this is one of the hardest matches I've ever won. And about half the time, there was someone on the world team who had studied that particular configuration of the chessboard. 
and someone self-nominated to shepherd the team and was able to clearly recognize who had the best idea for that particular move. And so the woman who was the shepherd, who essentially cast the vote for the whole team, she was tapping in to a network of micro-experts in chess. It turns out that patients and caregivers form micro-experts, form networks of micro-experts as well. So when you imagined yourself in that situation three months after that diagnosis, you weren't alone. There were hundreds, thousands of people like you who want to collaborate with you. That's the motivation for the company that I'm working on now called Smart Patients, and I'm delighted to share with you that we're launching publicly today. But, but this, is, this is part of something much bigger, an opportunity that's in front of all of us. So let, let's talk a little bit about how this idea works. What is, what is a network of micro-experts? So imagine that there's a community of 1,000 patients for a cancer, a rare cancer. And one of them joins the committee and says, I just found out that the second treatment, which is the second of two treatments that are proof my cancer is no longer working. What do I do? What about this clinical trial? What about that clinical trial? So a subset of the network comes forward and leads the discussion to answer that patient's question because they have researched this question before. They've been there. Their loved one has been there. They've gone and talked to the world expert in Houston, in Manhattan, in San Francisco, in London. And they bring that information back. And someone else in the community says, I get it, but you know what? There's this other study. It was just published a few months ago. You may not have seen it. What do you think about this? And together, they collaborate, discuss, figure out what questions do they need to ask next, what do they need to talk about with their clinicians. And then a few minutes later, someone else says, hi, I'm new to the community. One doctor told me that I need to get a CT scan to check for recurrence every three months, and one doctor told me every six months. Which is it? And a different subset of the network of micro-experts comes forward and says, here's what I know. I looked at the literature about this six months ago because I had the same question. It's actually really not clear. There's two leading experts in this field, as far as I can tell, and here's what they say, here's what they think about it. Obviously, you're going to need to make a decision in collaboration with your caregivers. Another story, and by the way, almost everything I'm telling you, I, I learned from my current partner, co-founder, Gilles Friedman, and I just talk louder than he does, so I'm, I'm, telling, I'm telling you the stories. Same Lyomyar sarcoma community about 10 years ago. The community noticed that there was a subset of the patients that did quite a bit worse, didn't know why. And then one of the members of the community, a high school teacher, heard a story that there was a researcher who had found a gene, and that if that gene was mutated, you might not have leiomyosarcoma, you might have a different cancer that was just recently described called GIST, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. She told the community about this, connected them with a the researcher, a whole bunch of people in the community got tested, and many of them had the mutation, joined the researcher's clinical trial for a new drug that targeted that mutation, and many of them got better. Lives were saved. Even more importantly, the trial was completed two to three years sooner than it would have been because so many patients from the community joined it, the drug turned out indeed to be proved effective, and many more people got access to that therapy much sooner. So the stars are aligning here. We have the opportunity to do better science faster because we have motivated patients and caregivers who are unbelievably informed. We have technology that makes it really easy for them to collaborate at scale. And because of all of you, we have a culture that's just ready to embrace this notion of a real peer-to-beer -peer collaboration. And the biggest value here isn't the sub-graphs that we can draw, that we can, that we can predict. It's in the unexpected connections. What will emerge from these networks? We need networks that continuously reconfigure. 
Most of what we've done so far in healthcare is based on silos. And if you ask a question inside of one silo, inside of one subspecialty, it's very difficult to learn if there's insight about that question in one of the other silos. The, ba the databases that we've built so far that underlie our electronic medical record systems are pre-configured by design. And that means that it's difficult to see the emergent properties. And we need to nurture systems that are not pre-configured, but that can reconfigure depending on the context. In academic hospitals, if someone has a really complicated cancer case, their case is brought to what's called tumor board. And there, the radiation oncologist and the medical oncologist and the surgical oncologist and all of the other collaborators of the clinical team get together and talk about the nuances of the case. It's a case where there is no evidence base. We have to combine sort of relevant evidence and a lot of intuition and, and judgment. Now, if your cancer case wasn't even necessarily that complicated, wouldn't you want this kind of thoughtful collaboration to go into it? Now, patients have figured this out. And they're getting together in dynamic, open, informed networks of micro-experts. And the technology behind this is not that hard to build. We just need a little bit of imagination there are so many smart people out there. Let's learn more from them. Thank you.